What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage, Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. This is Girl Stop Playing, a weekly show that empowers black women to stop playing with their potential so they can live a life that they love. I'm Coriel, your favorite homegirl, and I'm on a mission to help black women make the money and get the honey. You can have it all as long as you're willing to work. Welcome back to another episode of the Girl Stop Playing podcast. It's your favorite homegirl, Coriel, here to encourage you to stop playing with your potential and start working for what you want in life and in love. You already know that I believe you can make the money and you can get the honey. You can have it all as long as you are willing to work. And today I got a working woman joining me in, not in the studio, I wish she was in the studio, but we are here at Girl Stop Playing. Nonetheless, we got Felicia Hatcher in the building. Welcome. What's up, Coriel? First of all, I can't tell you how much I love the name of your podcast (laughs) because women really need to stop playing. Listen, women really (laughs) need to stop playing and the work that you are doing are really providing them with the resources and the platform and the connection to do just that. So introduce yourself, okay? We got to make sure we put some respect on your name. So for the people who are not familiar, who is Felicia? Yeah, my name is Felicia Hatcher, um, Miami-based entrepreneur, CEO of uh, Pharrell Williams Black Ambition Opportunity uh, Fund, as well as I spend my days getting to help people find their genius, monetize their genius, and then fund their genius with with Black Ambition. Find and fund. Listen, a lot of the the emphasis is always on finding your purpose, finding your purpose, finding your purpose, but your purpose does not always pay you. Your purpose is, and, and usually, even if it does eventually pay you, it usually doesn't pay you up front, you know, at the beginning. And so the fact that you have created this resource um, as a solution to these horrible statistics that we are always hearing about, we just got to, you know, give you your flowers for doing this work. I know that it is, at this point, you're, you know, people are putting respect on your name. You are getting opportunities and you're getting recognition and all of this, all of this stuff. But I'm sure when you first started doing this work, it it was tireless. It was probably thankless. Um, people probably didn't even understand why you wanted to, like, dedicate your life to doing this work. So I just want to start out by commending you for doing the hard work so that it can lighten the load for other women. I appreciate that. And I think you only get to like that resolution to do those things because people did it before me. Right. And so whether you get to meet them in your lifetime or or not, like we only get to do what we do because of the people that come before us. And so I always wake up in the morning, uh, you know, in the business world, we talk about ROI. So return on investment. And I also prioritize ROS, like return on sacrifice. Right. There's so many people that sacrifice and sometimes the ultimate sacrifice, right? For us to be able to be here and do what we do. And so it's our obligation to do what we do at the highest level and and bring people along with us in the journey. Um, And that's why I get to do what I do. So take us back to pre Black Ambition Prize. Like what, what, what were you doing? And I mean, like directly, like right before this, what was that step? I was going to say, how free are we going? Um, I co-founded an organization with my husband called the Center for Black Innovation. Um, and then we also ran a conference called Black Tech Week. And so that was the work that I was doing right before um, Pharrell's chief of staff asked me to come and lead Black Ambition for him, which was an organization he founded four years ago. And so we were putting on a big tech- Black technology conference. Uh, we were the first to kind of make sure, not, not even kind of just make sure the Black community 
was an active participant and a financial beneficiary of the tech ecosystem and built that in Miami and really kind of the first in the state of Florida and really helped a lot of young people get introduced to coding, educators, and then um, find funding and then job opportunities in the tech space. And then we took that to eight other cities across the, the United States and built a co-working space, had two babies in all the middle of that as, as, as well. And so that was the work that, that I was doing before for seven years, right before um, Black Ambition. So I asked you that because I'm, sh I'm sure if people don't actually ask this, I know people be wondering, like, how did you get connected with Pharrell? Like, how did that connection come together? But it was what I thought it was, which was your work was yeah. doing the work. Your work was speaking for itself. Um, and I'm assuming, you correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but I'm assuming it was your work that made the chief of staff reach out to you and not necessarily just, I mean, it, I do believe in, don't get me wrong, I do believe in it's all about who you know and who knows you. But I also mm -hmm. think there is just so much emphasis that needs to be put on the work that you do outside of like, trying to make a name for yourself and trying to connect with the who's who and trying to be on this platform and get all these followers truly doing the work yeah. is usually the recipe. Yeah. It's a, it's really a combination of everything that you said. Right. And so I think we have all these really prolific sayings that are kind of incomplete. So it's definitely uh, who, who knows you, who do you know, but do they know what you do and that you can produce results and solve problems for them? I think is the other part that people don't like complete the full cycle of that. Of that, And so you can have all the best connections in the world, you can have all the best following, but if people don't know that you are a solution to their problems or that you were a vessel or, or a conduit and the thing can't happen unless you are part of it or involved in it, you're touching it, you're advising it, then it doesn't happen for them. And I think when people are creating content, when they're building their personal brands, that's the thing that they also have to make sure that they're communicating more than more than anything. And then being a social entrepreneur um, and being a very like high profile and visible social entrepreneur. But then also my husband and I starting at a time where we didn't have any connections in my, Miami. Neither one of us were from Miami. And you have to you have to get to a point where you create a formidable force around who you are and when you walk in the room. Why? Because when you're advocating on behalf of people, especially when you're talking about those that are underrepresented and under-resourced um, and getting them the funding that they need when everyone is dismissive, everyone is um, not trustworthy of Black people and dollars. Like I can go on and on and on about all of that all day long. And so you do need to make sure not only are you building a brand, but you are also building a formidable force that people understand that like they cannot disappoint you and they cannot disappoint your community and your tribe. Other, otherwise they got some answering to do, right? And it's gonna hurt in the answering, right? And so those are things that we learned along the pathway, but I did not have connections when we first started. Um, it had a lot of passion and you cannot take passion to the bank. <laughs> they don't cash that check. I, I know that for sure, right? And um, But then I just knew there was such a bigger calling on what we needed to do. And a lot of that, I think, when people go down this path is you're starting, the thing that you wish you had when you started, right? And so as an entrepreneur, not having community and not feeling like there was a voice that advocated for me. Uh, I remember my husband and I, got, and I got our first like VC investment. I didn't have an uncle that was a lawyer that could review my term sheet. I didn't have any friends that had received significant investment for their food business before. And so it feels very isolating because I think when you look at other communities, well, you can go talk to the uncle that's the lawyer or the banker or they know someone. And my dad had at that point been in business for over 20 years and he thought it was a scam because why? There's so many predatory financial everything that happens into our community. And so we enter entrepreneurship and sometimes we get the right opportunities, but we feel like it's gonna be this other predatory thing that's gonna happen to us. And sometimes we don't take advantage of it or we don't know how to say yes or no to it as a result of the unhealed financial trauma that has happened to so many of us. Man, you said so much. Um, it's so, so many like residual, there's so much residual impact to like post slavery oh, America. Yeah. You know, it's just so many things that we deal with that you don't even know that it's linked to slavery until you are, you know, in it and feeling it and fit, trying to figure out why are we so far, you know, such, such at such a disadvantage than other cultures mm -hmm. and other communities. And I was actually um, reading about a study 
a professor did a study because he was noticing that the black children, the black students in his class, it was a college professor, black students in his class were failing at an alarming rate. They were just as bright. They had, you know, the the same intelligence as the other group that he was paying attention to was the Asian um, mm-hmm. students, the Asian population in his in his class. And when he really started to like really study their study habits, he learned that the black students weren't necessarily failing. They were leaving. They were dropping out out of mm-hmm. frustration because the black students lacked community. The yeah. black students were independently studying and just striving and trying to do everything on their own, whereas the Asian students were getting together and mm-hmm. they were taking advantage and leveraging one another. And I think that that one just small study is such a big representation of how the black community operates. And then we wonder why we're struggling because we're in these little silos trying to figure it out on our own. Uh, but I, I, Corey, I feel it's a little bit, I, I know the study that you're talking about, but I feel like it's a little bit more nuanced than that, right? Because as black people, we are communal, right? Like that is literally how we are for gener- generations, right? Like you think of how we transport language and story and tradition or through griots, right? People centering around this one person that was the share of information and the share of legacy. You think about like how we, like, like even how we commerce, like we commerce different, right? Like we uh, the nucleus of Black business is centered around the Black church, where we all come together every single Sunday and from all different walks of life. And business actually gets done. It just doesn't get lauded and talked about in the way that, that it should. And so where I think the mistake happens is not that we aren't communal. What we have been told is that we have to know all and be all. And that is the problem. And so what you see on other instances in other communities, I think what's the biggest um eye-opener, like post-college for most people, is that you are not expected to know everything, right? You're not expected to memorize all these things. It's how resourceful can you be? If you are not the person with the answer, then go out and find it. And that's something that I had to personally unlearn. And it's something that I think all the entrepreneurs in any of the programs that I've run, run, it's constantly helping them understand that like you got to zero in on your personal zone of genius, And it is okay to go out and ask for help. It's actually the biggest sign of strength as opposed to it being told that it's a weakness. So I think for us in our community, it's not that we're not communal and it's not that we don't share because we do. Um, It is the fact that we have been told things that have been counterintuitive to us over and over and over again. And that's what shows up. It's like, you got to know everything. If you go ask that person over there that clearly keeps raising their hand and know all the answers, you're going to be seen as weak. You got to know and remember. And, and that's not the case. We know that's not the case. And so how do we develop stronger teams is, is, is the real reality of what we need to figure out. And how do we disassociate weakness with asking for help is the other thing. And I know that firsthand as an entrepreneur, because I burnt out twice as an entrepreneur. I don't wish burnout on my worst enemy. And I feel like- What does like, that look like, Felicia? What does yeah. burnout look what, like? So I had this conversation with someone recently at a retreat because the person was saying that they were burnt out, right? And when they start describing how like burnout, I was like, oh, baby girl, that is not burnout like, at all. Um, the best way I can reference burnout is because I was a, you know, a, I have two kids, a 10 year old and a five year old. Both my kids were born as micro preemies. And so it was a long, long journey. My daughter was born at almost 24 weeks uh, um, and weighed 1.4 pounds when she was born. And so we spent four they months. They are healthy and thriving now. They're healthy and thriving. I mean, you know, we're, we're, it's still a journey, but not nearly as significant as, as in the beginning. But I, I raise that because I had postpartum depression twice. I did not realize it was postpartum depression. Why? Because I think our ho- hospital systems and our doctors do a really piss poor job in helping women, especially black women, identify what postpartum is. You go to your first doctor's appointment, they hold up five smiley faces and you post a pic one on how you feel. Burn, postpartum may have not even hit you by that time. And so what I realized and why I bring that up and why I felt like it was similar to me is because it literally starts to seep into the fabric of who you are, right? Like you don't want to get out of the bed. You don't want to do the things that you normally love to do. You are you can get short tempered. You're highly emotional. Anything and everything makes you cry. Um, but like there is just this embodiment of this thing that kind of covers you, doesn't really suffocate you, but it just stops you in your tracks and you disassociate with any and everything that you really kind of care about. 
And to me, burnout professionally happened a lot in the same way. It doesn't, it's not a brick wall all at once. It literally just kind of seeps. I don't want to answer that email. I don't want to go to that meeting. Like, I love that client, but like every single thing they send to me, I cannot stand right now. Um, the ideas that usually flow to me are not flowing anymore. And like, those are the signs of it starting to creep up. And then you get to a point where it's a brick road and you can't do anything and you can't be who you are or who you've always been for anybody around you. But more than anything, you can't be any of that to yourself. And so I just, I make that comparison. I don't know if people will like uh, push back on that, but I know in my body, they felt the same way. Um, just one was very personal and then one is on the professional side. And it can happen for both, but those were the two different instances in which it showed up for me. And so I, I say that because I think people throw around burnout so much now and I'm like, no, you're tired. You're misaligned. Go take a break, <laughs> right? Like realign your calendar and, and see if it's just exhaustion um, or misalignment, or are you truly, truly, truly on the road to, to burnout? Because those are two different things. And a nap can make you feel much better. A nap from burnout is not going to make you feel better. And that's how you start to know. The, the, and I'm not a medical professional. I'm just a person who personally experienced it and the nuances of that over the years of, of running businesses and organizations. People don't talk about postpartum enough. People mm -hmm. don't talk about... I am I am of the belief that everybody experiences post I mean postpartum is a period after you have birth. So yes, we all go through postpartum, but I am of the belief that everyone physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually goes through that transition, mm -hmm. that uncomfortable transition. It affects us all in different ways and it affects you differently with each child. You know, with each birth, it can be a different experience. But I just don't think as a community, you talked about, you know, you mentioned the hospital system, but just as a just people, we don't talk enough about it. We don't give ourselves or one another grace. There are very few solutions. The way that, you know, women are expected to just go right back to work, just drop that baby and get on out there. I mean, all of it is just insanity. So to add the uncertainty of entrepreneurship right. in the mix, it's like a recipe for disaster. If you don't, you know, if you're not prepared for it, which a lot of people are not. So how did you get yourself out of burnout because and i don't know but i don't know if it's just my timeline you tell me about your timeline felicia but on my timeline <laughs> the people are burnt okay yeah. they are they are i mean i have not and i and i'm saying this jokingly but it's really not funny the number of people that i've seen like closing their businesses down like forget this i'm going back to get a job i i mean just the the sadness the stress this is just a crazy season that we're in. So for people who are in that season right now and may be on the brink of burnout, what worked for you or what can you offer to them? Yeah. Uh, so so a few things, right? And, and my, a few things. I'm, I'm taking a woosah because I'm having so many conversations with entrepreneur friends and then entrepreneurs that I support that are in the middle of it, touching the hem of burnout. Like it's, it's so many, right? Um, what was a big re re revelation, realization around this was the height and the beginning of the pandemic. And it took a global pandemic for many of us to get the rest that we needed. And I was just like, we have to really kind of listen to that, right? Like the world is literally falling apart and you have entrepreneurs, you have innovators, you have creators saying, this is the most stillness that I've received. This is the most time I've actually spent in my home. This is the most time I've spent with my kids. This is the most time I spent with my family. This is the most time I've actually spent with myself and my thoughts while the rest of the world was falling apart. And that has to be a big red flag about what has been brought into entrepreneurship, uh, the grind and the hustle um, that is not sustainable, the lack of sleep. Right. And I love the sleep ministry on, on Instagram because I had to stop that. Like there was a time where people just bragged about like, I only got two hours of sleep. No, I if I do not get my eight hours, do not talk to me. I am not a friendly person. And I had to realize that about myself. Right. And then I think in this culture, especially in this tech and startup culture, on um, which I spent most of my career, it was almost like you, you would get to South by Southwest or Afrotech or any of these conferences. And you're almost kind of swapping notes about 
how exhausted each other was and kind of almost one upping one upping it. And I went to a conference last year called Mind Valley. That was it's all like spirituality and like really interesting conference. But I spoke there, it was really it was really cool. And I remember saying to someone, they were asking me, like, how are you doing? I was like, man, I'm I'm running on fumes. I bet you are too. And they're like, I'm not. I was like, I was like, huh? And they're like, yeah, I'm I'm not. Like, I feel very centered and I feel very relaxed getting ready to go. And it's it was just one sentence that kind of took me out of a loop because I am used to comparing exhaustion for exhaustion with my friends that are doing this work with me. And it just took me out of this thing of just like, why do I automatically assume like the other person is exhausted? Moreover, why am I so willing to talk about my exhaustion and not talk about a solution to it? And so those are some of the things that I have seen, right? That are very problematic that we have to fix. And I hope, I think a lot of us hope that coming out of the pandemic, people would have changed their life experiences and the things that they do to better support their wellness because so many people took and prioritized wellness and care for themselves and their teams in a way that they hadn't before. And then when the world work opened back up, it was like the to hell with wellness, to hell with work-life balance, to hell with all of that. And so what has helped me from postpartum twice, burnout twice, is um, I had to realize if you don't have the village, you got to pay for the village. And I know that that's not something that everyone can afford. And so I get the pushback, but you got to do it incrementally because there you get no badge of honor, especially as a woman from wearing the superwoman cape and trying to be everything to everybody and not yourself. And so, you know, with the thing that was probably the, the the expense that my husband and I agreed upon, happily paid for, have done it for over 15 years, um, was a cleaning person. And I remember the first time we got a cleaning person because we were fighting over every we were fighting about everything that had no, had nothing to do with what the issue was. It was like, who going to clean that thing after both of us have been in the office all day? And it became the big, the most important expense that we could do was to empower and pay somebody else to do the thing so that we could take care of ourselves and each other. And that was like our first entree into outsourcing. Then it was just like, okay, can we outsource it? Like, what else can we free our time with? Because time is a commodity that none of us get back. Then settled in the guilt around that. Cause I got a Jamaican mother. It's just like, you can do that yourself. You need to do that. Like your husband, I was like, my husband heavily pays the bill for the cleaning person because he realized it's not only a benefit to his wife, it's a benefit to him as, as well. And so what else can we do so that we stay in the pocket of our genius and you know what, we empower another person who's that thing that is not our genius is their genius. And that's how we started to build the support that, that we needed. Right. Um, childcare and babysitting. And we retired my mom almost two years ago. And so she helps us. Full time. Like These are the things that we had to make family and business decisions around in order to not burn out, but also be able to step into who we needed to be to super serve people. I don't do it all, all on my own. I have a fantastic team at Black Ambition. I have a fantastic husband. I will outsource anything immediately. And when ChatGTP and all the AI tools came along, I would say, this is the soft life that I've been asking for, right? And so you do it incrementally is what I tell people until you can fully outsource everything so that you can stay in the pocket of your genius because you don't serve anyone else when you do anything that's outside of that. You actually cause more harm than good. So what is this pocket of genius? Where is this zone? How do I how do I get into the zone that everyone is talking about? Like, where is this? The, the zone is within you for sure, right? But the zone only comes from honesty. And so when I was in burnout um, and like getting ready to hit the brick road of, of burnout, I um, was leaving a conference. I was leaving Miami, going to San Francisco in 24 hours and I needed to be in Kentucky was raising money for our organization, got there, killed the meeting, was packing up because I needed to be in Kentucky like later that afternoon. Your body is always going to tell you it's creeping up. It's it's telling you. Um, and Martha Beck has some phenomenal work around body compass because most of us are making 30 to 40,000 different decisions every single day. And we are no longer in tune with our intuition and in like our, bo like our body being able to tell us the decisions that we should make. And so, mm -hmm. yes, hold on to pause, trauma. Pause. Yeah. Body Compass. Body Compass by Martha Beck. Writing it down. Go ahead. 
please. Um, and so it's a process that you go through to calibrate your body to actually help you make better decisions. Your body's always going to tell you the truth. Your mind is going to lie to you. It's a beautiful, brilliant mind, but it's logistical. It can, it can, it can make, uh, it can justify anything that you need to do. We, we know that the, the, the boyfriend or the girlfriend that people had that you're like, you know, that person is not good for you. And you still did, you still made that phone. That's your body and your mind being out of alignment. Right. And so, um, and so body compass work is really, really important. I, end up leaving that conference, getting to my hotel and just start gushing in tears, crying. I wasn't, it wasn't tears of sadness. It was literally exhaustion leaving my body. I tell you that story because I have been walking around with this book by Gay Hendricks called The Big Leap for maybe about six months, maybe, maybe even close to a year. Had took the picture on for Instagram. I'm reading this book, but I hadn't really read the book, right? And uh, the Bruce Lee quote, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. I had not been ready at any point to be still enough to listen and like read what and receive what that book had to say. And there's two big lessons in that book, but I really kind of centered my work around the zone of genius because it was one of the most transformational things that happened to me was like, okay, there's the zone of incompetence, there's a zone of confidence, there's a zone of excellence, and there's a zone of genius the only way you get to your zone of genius is going through that process of elimination of identifying what are the things that are in my zone of competence. I'm incompetent. I have no business doing them. I suck at doing these things. Why am I saying yes to these things that I suck at? Stop doing them. And then your zone of competence is you know how to do them. You have a level of competence in doing them, but there's so many other people better in the world and equipped to do those things. It's the things that keep ending up on your to-do list every single week because you don't do them. You hate, do, you rather not do them, but you can do them. Your zone of excellence is you're really, really good at this stuff. You have a level of excellence. You probably make pretty good money doing this. People come to you quite often and say, can you, Gorio, can you do this thing for me in only the way that you can? You say, yes, yes, I can, because you can do it. And you've done it. You probably have your degree in it and you've had some level of financial success, but you have not fully exhausted your gifts. And you're you're still a little tired. And that's to me, that's where burnout is really tricky is in the zone of excellence box, because it's also your comfort zone and you have a low level of stagnation. You feel really stuck in doing this, but you know that there's more in you and your zone of genius is the more but it's, it's also the less. And so you get to show up in the highest version of yourself in your zone of genius, but you're not- What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. No longer exhausted because you enter something called the Kazen, Kazen which is... Japanese for the flow state. And there's an ease and the flow in how you do your thing, how you show up. And you, are in a, you have an insatiable desire to continue to learn more because when you're in your zone of genius, you don't know everything. You don't need to know everything, but you know your stuff. But you also have an insatiable desire to continue to learn because genius is a practice. But there is just this something that comes over your body, almost like a flushing sensation that like, I'm here where I'm supposed to be. You understand what I'm saying by that? And that's genius. I think I'm in my zone of excellence based on these descriptions. <laughs> you might be. And you go through, you got to go. And so people will ask me, like, Felicia, like, what is my zone of genius? I'm like, did you go through the quadrant to identify the other three things? Because as adults, we pick up, 
like Erica Badu, the bag lady, we pick up all these bad habits. We pick up yes culture. And especially as women, we say yes to everything, whether we can do it or not. Yes, baby, because I don't want to disappoint you. Right. Or yes, friend, I don't want to disappoint you. And so you cannot grab hold of what your genius is so that you can step into the pocket of it and only work in it all the time if you haven't identified what the other three are. The other part about genius that I think is really important is like you have a level of like dynamic confidence in your genius. And the root word of confidence means to confide and confide means to trust, right? And so if you trust that you can show up and deliver, then you are in your genius because it's about trusting your abilities and what you do in there. And your genius is the essence of who you are. So it shows up in everything that you do from the th whatever you decide to do and contribute to your, your kids PTA, to the soccer team, to the boards you're on, to how you show up in your business, how you show up in your relationship. There's a version of your core genius that shows up the exact same way. Right. Um, I'm a solution driven communicator. So in my marriage, I, I always want to talk it out. Right. I always want to talk it out. That's my genius showing up in, in, in my relationship. I don't want to go to bed being angry. I want to talk through that thing. Um, when I am on boards, I'm usually more drawn to the things that have me communicating something or creating something that communicates a vision or bringing investors and funders together to communicate the vision to get the thing done to create a solution. And so, um, and my kids stuff, like, that's how I know, like, I'm zeroed in on it because it shows up in the same way. And so you have to ask yourself, once you identify it, like, where else does this show up in my life? And it gives you a really clear indication if you are in your genius or not. And I think for most of us, when you're getting to that path, you're going to toggle between excellence and genius. But that's also how you know that you need help because your next hire or your best hire on your current, your, your best employee on your current team, whatever is in your zone of excellence box or zone of confidence box should be their genius. And if it's not, it's a misaligned person that's on your team because you need them so that you stay in the pocket of your genius because that's how you contribute the highest financially back into your business. If I'm making copies, if I am running the front desk at like an event that we're putting together, can I do it? Yes, but you know what? I am actually costing our organization money. Why? Because I fundraise and we give millions of dollars away with Black Ambition. So you guess what? I got to raise millions of dollars. And so if I'm running the front desk because that's a $25 an hour position, just throwing a number out there and not like um, not to demean anyone or anything like that. I'm not in the room with one of our funders who their next check may, may be $5 million. So I'm not saving the business $25. I'm costing the business, what, $4 million, whatever, whatever, right? Like I'm costing the, the business over close to $5 million. You get what I'm saying? And so that's how we have to think about our contributions, our genius. And it's not just monetary. It is literally the embodiment of who you are. Why wouldn't you want to be in your genius? That's where all the magic happens. That's where the flow happens. And that's where like your biggest breath of life happens when you're when you're in that state. So the big leap is this the, the book that we're to get into this zone. The big leap is the is a book by Gay Hendricks. The other thing that I think is. Although the zone of genius part has been the most transformational he has a chapter on there called the upper limiting problem and it identifies four areas in which we start to self-sabotage when we start getting into our genius to me that's the best part of the entire book the genius like changed my life but recognizing how self-sabotage happens as a result of us touching new levels and having our name on it, and it's being, we're doing it for the very first time. If we are not careful, we will personally put ourselves back down into our comfort zone because of fear of uh, judgment, right? Fear of failure. Like there's like four components and read the whole book, but zero Girl, in. I'm about to listen. Parts. When I press end, I'm about to get it up <laughs> on my audible right now because good. God is like, God is so good. The way that he had me having these conversations seemingly for the podcast and really they just be for me. 
I am, I am grateful. I truly, truly am grateful for you sharing that. Two resources, uh, Body Compass and The Big Leap. Definitely, I will put those um, in the notes below so that y'all can grab them. But I'm also personally adding those to my, to my library. Um, I wanted to ask you about confidence. And I feel like what you just said, how you just explained it, is probably why so many people suffer with imposter syndrome and have a hard time speaking up for themselves or even have a hard time with the people who know you, you know, it's all about who you know, who knows you, but then do they even know what you do? Because I think a part of them not knowing what you do is either you don't know what you do or you don't have that confidence to walk into the room like God sent you there, to walk into the room to speak to the person that could be on the, you know, opening the door, the next door for your next opportunity. Do you feel like the lack of confidence comes from you not being in your zone of genius? That's part one of the question. If not, my other part is, how do you build your confidence to walk into these rooms, to get into different communities so that you can grow your business? It, it definitely is centered around not knowing what your genius is. If you don't know what your genius is, you don't know what your contributions are. If you don't know what your contributions are, you don't even know why you're in the room. Right. And so and that goes back to literally, do you trust yourself? And so I implore people to remove like I don't feel comfortable or confident with like I don't trust myself. Because when you start saying that, it no automatically no one wants to say that, right? And you're like, man, I don't, it's just saying like, I, I don't feel that confident in this room right now. I, I don't trust myself in this. Then you're like, well, what, what do you mean you don't trust yourself, right? Like you literally start answering your question by just replacing it with the root word of what confidence actually means. Hell yeah, I trust myself. Why do I trust myself? Because I have a track record of success in these areas. And so sometimes it's literally doing a brain dump of any and everything you've done from like the corp being a corporate baddie to like your dance recital when you were six, like everything and putting that in a place where it's either on the notes section of your phone or somewhere tied to your desk. So in those moments where your confidence and trust in yourself is wavering, you can look at it and literally remind yourself of who the heck you are. Like, I, I cannot implore that. I, I cannot stress that enough because there are those moments. And I think imposter syndrome is a few things. I think it's a temporary lapse in judgment and of who we are, right? Like you just forget like who you are in this moment. Sometimes at least the Nichols calls it like we get into a room and we check the temperature and it feels too warm. It feels too hot in that room. Like everybody's popping that. Well, who am I? Who you said you are and who you always have showed up to be and how you have always delivered. The last thing I'll say about imposter syndrome, and it's my personal reframe on imposter syndrome from someone who suffered from imposter syndrome until I started reminding myself who I was over and over again. It's not an ego thing. It is a comfort in your skill set that you can deliver, right? But some of us will, once we found out what the term was for what we were feeling, imposter syndrome, start wearing it on our sleeves and our body like a badge of honor. Like I remember walking into a room to teach a class on imposter syndrome and people like, I got imposter syndrome, everybody, I got me too. And I was just like, but it's not anything to brag about. We gotta be very careful about the language that we say to ourselves. You're telling yourself over and over again, you are an imposter. And guess what? If you feel like you are an imposter, you are because you are pretending to be a nobody. You're pretending to be someone that has nothing to contribute. You're pretending to be the person in the room that has nothing to say, no solution. Like we are pretending to be no one. So that's why you feel like the imposter because you are somebody. You are someone very significant that can contribute, that can solve that problem. But every time you tell yourself you feel like you crouch down, then yes, you are being an imposter because you're pretending that you have nothing to contribute. And so if you reframe it that way, you stop wearing it as a badge of honor. And I know it's a psychological phenomenon where high performing women um, you know, can't like internalize their success, but at some point you gotta stop internalizing all the failure and all the noise and internalize who you have always been. And that way you can remove yourself from imposter syndrome and just say like, I am someone who's stepping into new levels that have my name on it every single day. Yes, it's uncomfortable because I've never been here before, but I'm only here because of what I've done. And if you remember that, you never question, do I deserve a seat at the table? Or how did I, like, imagine being in the rooms that you prayed for and you're still questioning that, like, how did I get in here? Because you prayed for it and you worked for it. Like, 
Any other thought that you have is wasted energy and prevents you from showing up as a person that can contribute to the room at the highest level and leave with what you came asking for. And so any of the unclarity about yourself, and I would say also unclear about what you want out of those rooms and those meetings and those environments also lead to not trusting yourself. You walk up to an event like, I don't know anybody that's in this room. I don't know like what I want out of it. Yeah, you're going to not trust yourself because you are not clear. And so I do my homework all the time. Like even at the like career level that, that I'm at, I am I have my assistant like send me put the link in the calendar invite, put a link to their LinkedIn, give me some information just in case I don't have the time to do those things myself. And that way when I'm going to a conference or I'm speaking at a conference, these are the 10 people that I want to make sure I meet. I know something about them so that I don't have a weird conversation with them because I'm a functioning introvert. Like you, when you know these things about you, well, do something about it, right? To level the playing field, to make it easier for you to be able to contribute. And then when it's, when it's necessary, then extract exactly what you need because that's why you're there. I should just drop the mic and just close my laptop at this point because what you you are an imposter because you're pretending to be a nobody mm -hmm. baby that was all i needed to hear that was it because what yeah okay i'm seriously gonna need time to gather myself so i'm gonna ask you this <laughs> last question because i cannot have you here uh -huh. people would like literally like unsubscribe if I have you here and don't ask about funding. Okay. So okay. I want, but this is what I want to ask. I want to ask not how to prepare for a pitch and you know, those like ABC one, two, three questions that you can Google and you can probably Google this one too, but based on your personal experience and the tons of um, entrepreneurs and companies you've worked with, how would you describe when an entrepreneur would know they're ready mm -hmm. for outside funding, whether Ooh. it's, a VC, a pitch competition, or anything? Yeah. Oh, you need to always be ready for funding. Um, and it's not just angel and VC. It comes in so many different ways, right? And so, um, and, and I, I say that because it's a relationship game. It's so much of no like, and trust. Anybody tells you anything different, they are absolutely lying, right? Even when you go through a portal and a process, well, like the questions that you're ask, you're answering help someone know you a little bit better, like you a little bit better, and trust you. And if there is no trust, there is no transaction. Like, don't let anyone tell you anything different. It doesn't matter how it's coming. There's all these alternative sources of funding, but it all plays out the exact same way, right? Your credit score shows your trustworthiness with money, right? Like your track record, your career, even if it's in corporate leading to um, entrepreneurship, that builds a level of trust. Like, oh, this company trusted you. Well, that gives a, we can extract a little of that trust into this new relationship. And so I say that because you want to start building the relationships because very rarely do you meet with someone immediately and they're like, here's a checkbook. Like people don't carry checkbooks, first of all, right? And so here's, I'm writing you, you know, $5 million check. It's a process. It's a dance. There are conversations. There are committees. There's all these different things. And so you want to cultivate those relationships before you're ready. The other part of that is you want to nurture those relationships before you're ready. Because as a funder, as an investor, you, you are a human being, but people come to you all the time as only looking at you as a big check. And so the person that checks in with you, like it's Mother's Day is coming up. We talked about that right before we went live, right? Like who's going to check on, just send me a text. Happy Mother's Day, Felicia. It's the simplest thing to do. It doesn't cost you anything. But you know what? The next time that person calls me, I'm not going to ignore their call. Like, man, they only call me because they need something. We've all been in that situation. And more than anything, you don't want to be the person on the other end that's being ducked and dodged because you haven't nurtured the relationship and you're only calling them for something that you need. They're there for the thing that you need, but they're human beings, right? These are some ancillary things that I'm talking about as that's different from like the structural stuff. But these are the things that I think are foundational that people get wrong all the time. Build a relationship before you need the money. Continue to nurture the relationship. And then for the life of me, once you get the check, continue to nurture the relationship. Why? Because it's much easier for you to double back to that original funder that believed in you for the first time, or was it there for you in the beginning or at different stages of your funding need, than it is to go and spark a whole new relationship. But guess what? They got other relationships too. 
that have deep trust because they are money people. Don't you, wouldn't it be easier for you to just go back to that person and ask them to make a very warm introduction for you? Yes, but so many of us don't nurture the relationships after the fact, right? The holidays make it so easy. Holidays make it so easy to re like reinvigorate an old relationship. You didn't talk to the person throughout the entire year. Christmas card, New Year's card. Happy New Year. I was just thinking about you. All of a sudden, it just reinvigorates the person and it makes them want to learn more. They want to hear updates about what, what you're doing. But if you don't do those three things along the different stages of, of funding, then you've lost a very powerful person that can not only be an advocate, but that can be a second, third and fourth and fifth check along the ways in which you need it. So for people who are well, everybody needs to be ready is what we just found out. So for everybody listening um, who may be interested in Black Ambition Prize, how can we learn more about it? Well, for people who don't know what it is, uh -huh. explain what it is and then how people can learn more about it if they're interested. Yeah. So Black Ambition was founded by Pharrell Williams four years ago um, to create uninterrupted pathways to entrepreneurship and through entrepreneurship to create wealth in Black, Hispanic, and then HBCU communities. And so... We invest in startups, we mentor them through a three month cohort style mentorship program, and then we align them with some of our amazing partners, right? We just did a two day learning lab at Louis Vuitton's headquarter and distribution center for about 35 of our entrepreneurs that we invested in last year, right? Um, and, and then like connect them to VCs, help them get on retail shops. And so it's literally a like lightning rod accelerant once they get into the program and then definitely once we invest in the companies and so every year we open up the application and the prize um, to find entrepreneurs all over the united states and so the application is literally open right now uh the 2024 application closes uh now on may 17th uh, let me make sure i got the date right corey before my team may 17th is when the the, the new application we extended it uh closes and so we're looking for companies in tech, healthcare, media and entertainment, consumer goods and services, and then AI. And then we write check sizes between 25K to 1 million. And so we do one $1 million investment every single year. And then the rest of the checks, about 34 of them, range from 25K to about 250K. And our entrepreneurs have gone on to raise over 95 and counting. Every time I, every week I say that number, it goes up. That's how impressive the companies are, but it also is a testament to the need, right? Like you fund these entrepreneurs, you give them what they need and then get out of their way. Like if you cannot be helpful, just get out of their way because they're brilliant. They're amazing. They just need a few different things to help them along the pathway. And then they're building amazing companies and becoming employers. And so if that is you and you want a massive and amazing community, uh, you want, you know, the accelerant of Pharrell being like in the orbit of your business and on your cap table, then like definitely apply for the prize. And if it's not for you, share it with someone in your life that you feel could benefit from everything that I mentioned. Bomb.com. Felicia, I can't wait to hug you in real life because yes. this was so needed. I didn't get to literally like, I think I asked you one question that I had on my list over here. I do um, a Williams and I just started. Listen, yes, you can't really it. It, it was needed. I that is always my prayer though. Seriously, it's like what needs to come out will come out. Forget what I thought we were supposed to talk mm -hmm. about. Like, give me what it's supposed to what I'm supposed to get. So I appreciate mm -hmm. it. I know the people listening to this are like, girl, is it over? Yes, part one is over. We're gonna see if we can get Felicia back for part well, two. But in the meantime. Please let the people know where they can find you online and how they can keep up with you. Yeah, um, I'm literally at Felicia Hatcher on everything because it's easy for me to remember. And that's Felicia with two E's. And then for Black Ambition, at Black Ambition Prize or BlackAmbitionPrize.com to find the application. And then, Coriel, thank you so much because I, I, as much as I love talking about genius, I love when I get to walk into someone else's genius and the way that you just light up and like the way I've seen you show up for people and their stories and where they're going and like that accelerant within itself. It's been such a joy to watch it from afar and then to like literally be a part of walking into it today. And so thank you. Girl, so what, is this my genius? Am I in it? Felicia, yes. I in it? Yes. Okay. Okay. That's something I need to sit with then. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you. And I, I'm, I'm going to hit you up. Okay. Thank sounds you. good. Sounds good. Thank you.
Y'all, thank you for tuning in. I know y'all was like, am I on a personal phone call? I'm sorry, y'all. That was just, that did something to me. Thank y'all for tuning in to another episode of Girl Stop Playing. Make sure you subscribe. Um, do all the things. I'm at a loss for words because thank you, Felicia. Y'all, I'll see y'all next week. Peace out. So if you made it this far, I just know you loved that episode. Well, what you did not know is that we recorded it right here in ATL at Elevate Studios. Yes, your girl has her own studio, y'all. And it's not just for me. I'm opening it up for you, too. So if you have a podcast, if you are a vlogger, a YouTuber, or a content creator, and you are looking for a professional studio to record your content or you want to hire me and my team to fully produce your content, make sure you check out the show notes below or log on to elevateagency.com. What does innovation sound like? It sounds like the luxury of being in the moment with your customer, client, or patient. It sounds like having the right information right when you need it. It sounds like being at your best for your customers and your business. Thanks to Highland's intelligent content solutions that improve digital processes, innovators everywhere are able to do their thing better, whatever that thing is. Now, who doesn't like the sound of that? Highland, for innovators everywhere, visit highland.com. Summer concerts, pool parties, chill nights under the stars. We're stocking up our closet so you're ready to look your best for all of it. At Plato's Closet in West Ashley and North Charleston, we're buying all things summer. So bring in your tees, tote bags, sandals, sunglasses, and more. We pay cash on the spot for gently loved name brand looks. Plato's Closet is the go-to destination for trend-forward teens and young adults who support local and shop sustainable. Visit Plato's Closet today. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue.